Okay, brilliant. So welcome everyone. Uh, so this is our Earth Day discussion um, and very pleased to be joined uh, by Suzanne Rogers uh, from Social Justice Ireland, who is going to present on uh, the Social Justice Ireland, uh, the National so Social Monitor. Uh, and this edition of it was on a just transition, which uh, obviously is very relevant to everybody here. Um, and given that it's Earth Day, uh, we uh, wanted to, to mark that day with a discussion. Um, and in particular, we considered putting uh, the context of, the, of that discussion about the intersection between climate and social justice um, and environmental justice and social justice as well. Uh, so it was it was very fortunate, uh, Suzanne, to come across uh, your report uh, last week, and it's it's pretty much fresh off the presses. Uh, yes. And um, look, I'll, I'll leave you uh, to introduce it and to present it, uh, and then afterwards we can have, have a discussion. So okay. it is just five past seven now, uh, and we will aim for about an hour of a presentation and discussion. So we have until about eight o'clock. Brilliant. Okay. Over I to have them. Try to squeeze this into as short as possible a time. I've done about three rounds of it, so I'll do my very best. I'm going to share screen. Hopefully, everybody can see this. Um, just make sure I have that there. I have the right one. Are we in? We're good? Excellent. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> I suppose first you want to say thank you to Oliver and the team for the invite. Um, thank you very, very much, especially on, on Earth Day. So he's introduced me. I am Suzanne Rogers, Research and Policy Analyst with Social Justice Ireland. So, <clears throat> excuse me, for anybody who doesn't know who we are, we're an independent social justice think tank. And it's really for us, it's, it's about evidence-based research, evidence-based policy looking to see with the resources we have how do we make the world a better place for for all of us to, to be in so that's really what we're about and we're coming at that from our human rights and a common good angle so the national social monitor that we've just done now we, we we produce a couple of these a year and we cover the same 10 topics every time but through a different lens so this time it's a just transition lens the last time was European pillar of social rights. So we're looking at the, the same thing every time, but looking at it just from a slightly different angle, coming at it from a different point of view. And I suppose from a just transition point of view, we're so aware that Ireland and the wider world is really, we're moving so quickly towards that deadline of 2030. And by that time, we are supposed to have delivered on the climate strategy and the sustainable development goals. So there's only eight years left. Now, I know if I went downstairs and cleaned out the back of my kitchen cupboard, I'd find a thing of gravy or a tub of salt that probably went out of date eight years ago. It's a really short period of time. So we, and, and I suppose there seems to be either very little awareness amongst many of us, including policymakers, that substantial changes will have to be made at every level, from individual to local, national, right the way through to global level, if we're gonna reach these targets. So even where the necessary awareness is apparent, there's no evidence that sufficient measures are being put into place to meet these goals. So ensuring that these changes are made and more importantly, that the impact of these changes is shared fairly by all of us, it is going to require huge adjustments in all of our lives. So it's essential that that just transition process is put into place to enable people to reach this new way of living. The coming decade will be one of transformation as we try and meet our climate goals. And I suppose at the outset, I do need to say that the National Social Monitor doesn't even attempt to cover all of the possibilities or challenge posed by a just transition. It's really just about trying to add to the contribution for an ongoing public debate. So our first topic is always housing and homelessness. And again, everybody's aware that we have, a, I suppose, a dual challenge of providing an adequate supply of housing whilst also meeting the climate action goals. And that's going to be a real, real challenge. So bringing vacant and derelict sites back into use must really play a part. According to the last census, and I appreciate that we're, we're hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get the results of the, the current one as quickly as possible. But according to the last census, on census night, there were 183,000 vacant properties, not including holiday homes across the country. An analysis that we did ourselves shows that in every single county, there were more vacant homes than households on the official social housing waiting list. So, okay, we appreciate that utilising these properties 
isn't going to be very very straightforward or very simple but maybe by using compulsory sale orders or compulsory purchase orders you'd be looking at bringing back at least a proportion of these into use and again we're so conscious obviously that the ukrainian you know that there's been a huge influx of people in a very very short space of time it is going to require us to be very inventive about how we house people and then i suppose the second challenge then in housing and homelessness is to look at new low carbon building methods and materials that can help us meet again this, it is that dual crisis of building enough home for people whilst also meeting climate action goals there needs to be a reduction in the building industry reliance on concrete so the national recovery and resilience plan does note that concrete is very carbon intensive and it's very bad for the environment so this chart here you can see just shows the i suppose the increase in the number of timber frame homes in ireland and we're, we're very wedded to brick you know i, I presume it's, it's a cold wet windy country you know we, we don't think really of timber homes as being fit for purpose here but it can be done and it is being done and again it's something and obviously there's going to be a conversation then about you know sourcing timber but in terms of um i suppose climate action it is it's, it's a it's a better material to be building homes with and what we're conscious of as well, I suppose, is that new ways of building and renovating homes will require new ways of working and will require workers with these new skills. So our policy priorities then for <clears throat> this particular, uh, excuse me, this particular aspect is to implement a site value tax. It's a much fairer and much more effective system to encourage owners of vacant and derelict sites to bring them back into use to again when we're looking at empty homes that we resource our local authorities to make sure that voids are brought back into use and to introduce new building methods and materials that lower the carbon footprint on construction and again to ensure that the you know by delivering apprenticeship and skill programs that the workers are there in order to be able to deliver these homes so our next one then is healthcare <coughs> excuse me um, it's well documented now that Ireland's population is growing and ageing, which is huge. This is to be celebrated. It's brilliant. More and more and more of us are living longer. But there is a challenge in that, that we will require care as we age. So these changes will profoundly impact the delivery of health care as our health care needs will change accordingly. The pandemic put an unprecedented strain on our health care system and it highlighted the over-reliance on acute systems which dominates the Irish healthcare infrastructure. And the pandemic really also highlighted deficiencies in nursing home care and governance, a concern in light of how many older people are availing of this support. So we can just see now again it's from 2016, but just to give you an idea of the you know the, the numbers of, of people in uh, <clears throat> in communal establishments. And again I suppose you can see the, the male female imbalance there as well as we age which is, <clears throat> excuse me, another issue for healthcare. I'm going to have a little sup of tea. I think I've been talking too much today already. Um, and then, um, sorry, I suppose, yeah, the, with a low level of formal help home care as well, sorry, I should have left it on the previous slide, by comparison with several other countries. And research suggests that 38% of older people who need home care are not having their needs met. The ESRI have projected that demand for health and social care are increasing across all sectors, including home care. And again, the HSC as well has suggested that home care has not kept pace with population growth or population ageing, and that demand for home support continues to exceed the level that is funded. So as we are ageing, most of us, I mean, I, I, like, I like my house, I want to stay in my house. I don't see why that would change in the next 20 or 30 years as I get older. So we need to be having these conversations. And then in terms of um, other unmet health needs, the OECD has highlighted how in Ireland many hospital admissions could be avoided, especially for things like asthma and COPD, if there were improvements in primary care. So countries with strong primary care sector have better health outcomes, greater equity, lower mortality rates and lower overall costs of healthcare. So we can see here on this one, that this is the levels of unreported, so self-reported unmet needs for medical examinations in Ireland between 2011 and 2020, either on the grounds of it being too expensive or waiting times. Now we can again we can see here like there's visible improvements across this. Obviously, 2020 is probably 
it'll be well skewed after that. <clears throat> But again, more resources are needed to ensure that no one is left waiting for a primary care appointment. And our policy priorities then in the healthcare would be to increase the availability and quality of primary and social care services and to create a statutory entitlement to home care. Education and skills then is the next one. And again, just as, as many of us are getting older, there will be fewer young people which will impact on how education resources are allocated. So projections from the Department of Education, as we can see here in, in enrolment, should be used to inform investment, plan for reducing class sizes and reducing pupil teacher ratios. A surplus of teachers at primary and post primary level is projected in 2036 if no action is taken now. And this presents government with an unprecedented opportunity to address the challenges regarding class sizes and pupil teacher ratios. So we currently have a pupil teacher, pupil, te I can't say it, pupil teacher ratio at primary level of 15.3 and the EU average is 14.7 and an average class size of 20 when the EU average is 20. Now in this chart, because I went and made all my charts green especially, I forgot then that you can't see Ireland very clearly, but if you come in from the left hand side, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, now again because the other countries seem to split it into upper and lower secondary, whereas we don't tend to keep stats for that. <clears throat> but you can see that you know it's it's much higher in terms of the um, the primary. It's it, it's quite noticeable that it is it's much much higher um, than you know the, kind of especially the EU average and a lot of our what we would consider to be our peer countries. So a reduction in student numbers doesn't necessarily mean a, a, a knock on reduction in expenditure. So we can implement policy instruments now to reduce class sizes, particularly as we said in that primary level, to reduce the ratio and ensure that demand and supply are managed appropriately. And smaller class sizes make the biggest difference to the youngest pupils. So that's really where ideally government policy should be targeting is those youngest classes in primary school. And that allows teachers then to provide early interventions without disruption. That's where you're gonna pick up on any, uh, I suppose, any extra, any extra needs that a student would have. It, it's usually apparent sort of quite early on if you have the time to be able to pay attention to each individual kid. And I suppose, again, it's well documented, but the impact of education across all age groups cannot be underestimated, and particularly for those in disadvantaged communities. The longer somebody stays in the educational system, the more likely they are to be in employment. Educational level attained is one of the most important individual factors in reducing the risk of poverty for adults. And as this educational level seems to be linked across generations, it's important for reducing child and household poverty. And again, welcome progress has been made at primary and post primary levels in terms of closing the achievement and attainment gap between DESH and non DESH schools. Significant gaps still exist, many of which have their basis in income inequality and again this is a cause for concern so our policy priorities then for education and skills is to create that plan then to inform investment looking at class sizes and our overall education system and again looking at that educational disadvantage by keeping average class sizes as small as possible and ensuring that the DESH schools have sufficient resources next one then is rural development I mean, this is the key one, I suppose, really, this is very important for Ireland. So restructuring agricultural and supporting and incentivizing farmers to move to a more sustainable agricultural practice is integral to a just transition in Ireland. A clear pathway for the farming community outlining how they will be supported as part of a just transition and the benefits of sustainable sorry, I got braces in, sustainable farming practice to our environment, natural capital, and most importantly, to their household incomes is essential. Although over a quarter of all 2014 to 2020 EU agricultural spending, more than 100 billion, was earmarked for climate change, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture have not decreased since 2010. In Ireland, they account for 37.1% of total emissions in 2020. This is because most measures supported by the Common Agricultural Policy, or CAP, have a low climate mitigation potential, and the CAP does not incentivize the use of climate, uh, effective climate-friendly practices. 
and the European Court of Auditors Special Report on the Common Agricultural Policy and Climate. I swear I write these things down deliberately and catch myself out on them. Notes that Ireland is one of the three EU member states in the report that have seen substantial emissions increases from livestock. So changes will have to be made to Irish farming practices and a just transition is going to be key to that. And the challenge really will be about ensuring that farm incomes alongside achieving climate action goals. So they, they have to be kind of kept in step. And that's really the, the key again is that there's, there has been a consistent trend over the past decade in the increased at risk of poverty rates in rural areas. So the latest figures show that the at risk of poverty rate in rural areas is higher than urban areas and if this is a persistent pattern. There's a significant regional variation with northern and western region which has the highest at risk of poverty rate and the lowest median income in the state. This region worryingly as well has also seen one of the greatest reductions of full-time employment since 2008 and has been one of the slowest to see the gains from increased employment growth in recent years. The low incomes in the northern and western region are also mirrored in farm income. So we can see here, it's just to give you a very brief, like again, you can see the difference between the state averages, the highly rural, the rural and the urban. You can see the different um, deprivation at risk of poverty and consistent poverty rates. Rural and regional policy has to grasp with issues such as higher poverty rates, lower median incomes, distance from everyday services and a higher rate of part-time employment. And it's worth reiterating here that our success in implementing policy to address these challenges will really determine how well-placed rural Ireland will be to respond to other challenges such as the impact of COVID-19, that impact to a sustainable society and the future of work. And our policy priorities here, again, you're looking at developing alternative agricultural models, moving away from intensive livestock, trying to support sustainable agricultural practice. And for those on low incomes, you're making tax credits refundable and introducing a universal basic income. We have to squeeze that in everywhere, the universal basic income. So that, that, that may crop up again. You, you may see it again. Work then is the next one. Uh, the world of work is also changing. So a report, a recent report, and again, bear with me, Digital Automation and the Future of Work by the European Parliament Research Service recognise the impacts of technological change on work and employment are multifaceted. On the one hand, technology impacts on the level of employment. I mean, I don't know where we would have been the last two years without that connectivity at home, without the ability to hold these Zoom meetings, without broadband and laptops. I mean, so many people just picked up their stuff and went home. It was, we, we couldn't have done this in the 80s or 90s if we'd had a similar type of lockdown. So we can, I suppose, celebrate the technology that allows us to maintain many of our, our jobs and many of the services that we came to expect. And then on the other hand, it also does affect the nature and quality of work itself. I saw a thing there was that a pub in Mayo has two robot waiters. Um, so, you know what I mean? It's just, it, it's, it is going to change how we do things. It can embed processes then of de-skilling and it does create and it does embed then low paid, low autonomy work. A report from Sullis showed that as of the end of 2019, there were approximately 373,500 people in Ireland who were employed in occupations that were considered at high risk of automation. Of the 16 occupational groups, these six groups here had the highest number of people employed in them. And again, these were the highest risk um, occupations. And these six groups combined account for 247,500 people or two thirds of that total. I think a key thing as well is to recognise work in all its forms. I mean, Social Justice Ireland believes that government should recognise in a more formal way all forms of work. We believe that everyone has the right to work, to contribute to his or own development and to that of the community and wider society. And we believe that policy making in this area should not be exclusively focused on job creation. We need to recognise that work and a job are not always the same thing. The impact of carers and volunteers should be recognised and supported. Volunteers and carers contribute 2 billion and 3.4 billion worth of work unpaid respectively to the economy. This work is heavily relied on to provide the services that would otherwise have to come from the exchequer 
at great expense. So our policy priorities here to resource and deliver that just transition programme to look again at retraining and support for communities that would be most impacted or um, possibly I suppose any uh, industries. I mean construction was badly hit in the last crash. I used to work in a record shop for decades. I mean that doesn't exist anymore. I mean you know like, what, what, what do you do when the only skill you have is and I can still remember them uh, the catalogue number for the best of the arrhythmics is PD74856 and the catalogue number for air supply is 260757. These are not skills I can bring anywhere else. So looking to make sure that people have access to um, programmes that will allow them to move from where they are to where they need to be. And again, that work is not synonymous with the concept of paid employment. So, we, you know, a much, much, much broader recognition of that. Governance and participation. Um, again, this is you know key, I suppose, in, in a democracy that we all have the ability to engage and to input and to, I suppose, influence policy. In 2014, the Local Government Act was amended to introduce public participation networks. And they input, so they facilitate input by community organisations into local government through this structure that tries to ensure public participation and representation on decision-making committees within local government. And these PPNs have been established in every local authority across Ireland. By the end of 2020, according to the annual report, there were just over 17 and a half thousand groups in total. Just under 14,000 of those were community and voluntary groups, 2,988 social inclusion groups and 613 local environmental organisations. So you can see a rough breakdown there. They work at a local level to bring issues of concern to the table of their local authority and to influence policies on these topics. And local knowledge and expertise at the decision making table will be of vital importance as we move towards just transition. A recent report then on the contrib contributions per member states on the Conference of the Future of Europe, it set out a profile of who the contributors were. In Ireland, almost two thirds were male, more than one third were aged between 40 and 54, one third were under 39 and 14% were over 55. In terms of occupation, more than three in five were either managers or professional workers. And what this tells us is that those most likely to be engaged in shaping the future of Europe at Irish level are highly educated middle aged men in professional or managerial positions. And that's just not reflective of the population as a whole. So barriers to participation are multiple and varied and policymakers must ensure that as many voices as possible are heard and included in deliberation. So our policy priorities here are to adequately resource the PPNs. And again, promoting deliberative democracy, inclusive social dialogue. And I think again, that it's more than a box ticking exercise as well. Somebody was telling me recently that they had, something had been called a citizens assembly or a mini public, but it only lasted a morning. So you're kind of going, well, that's just tea and a biscuit and a bit of a chat, you know? So we need to be careful about the language of consultation, the language of dialogue as well. Income distribution. Um, I mean, the real value of your income is what can be bought with it and inflation can therefore cause the real value of income to fall or rise. And if certain items we buy become more expensive, we have less to spend elsewhere and vice versa. So the Central Bank of Ireland had some interesting charts out recently and what they've noted, I suppose, is exactly that. When, when they when, when, you're, when you're trying to measure inflation, you're looking at an average basket of goods, but not everybody uses the same goods and services in the same way or in the same quantity. So it's different households then feel that impact of inflation at different levels. Lower income households use more food and energy. That tends to be where most of their income is going. So they, were much, they have been much more impacted by the rise in prices in those two areas recently. And again, it's, it's, so it's lower income households, it's older households, it's rural households, because again, if you think about it, if you're in a rural household, as we said earlier on, you have a further distance to go. Somebody today was only saying that I think they were at West Clare, the nearest A&E is an hour away in Limerick. Um, you know, you're going to get in your car and you're going to go to drive there if you can, um, you know, and the price of fuel, all of that. So it, it's those, it's particular households that are being impacted much more severely by the recent price increases than others. 
The central bank then also notes that policies to alleviate the recent cost of living increases should focus on the main driver of those increases, which have been energy related spending and consumption. Linking supports to existing social transfers, um, such as recent changes to the winter fuel allowance or assisting lower income groups in other ways will target the groups I suppose most affected. And again, for us, it's really about putting money in the pockets of people. For those in receipt of social welfare, we need to index or benchmark the social welfare rates to 27.5% of average earnings. That will require actually an increase of 27 euro. So what we would be looking for is an increase of 30 over the next two budgets. Social welfare recipients have had a five euro increase over the last three budgets. Now, your outgoings have definitely increased by more than five euro over the last three years. And again, for those on low pay, you're making your tax credits refundable. Taxation, we are coming towards the end. Um, taxation tends to be the one that, that where the shutters come down for a lot of people. Um, so I'll get through this one as quickly as I can. We believe, I suppose, that taxation policy should focus less on productive activity and more towards activity which reduces social well-being, depletes natural resources and biodiversity, harms the environment and contributes to climate change. The taxes that people and organisations pay should, to the greatest extent possible, be based on the value they subtract by their use of common resources. And again, I suppose fairness as well will be a key word in taxation policy. We've been calling for a review of tax expenditures as part of the national budget process for years. Um, and one element of these are environmental subsidies. Environmental subsidy is a current or capital transfer which is intended to support activities that protect the environment or reduce the use and extraction of natural resources. So environmental protection activities aim to prevent um, or reduce pollution, any other sort of negative impacts on the environment. There are several tax-based subsidies within the Irish tax code and in 2020 there 1.1 billion was paid in environmental subsidies. Eco-taxes then uh, would put a price on the full cost of resource extraction and pollution which would help with the transition towards a resource efficient low carbon green economy. I think this is really the crux of it is that we need to consume less but pay more for what we consume um, a lot of what we buy, we don't actually pay the full cost. So this, I suppose that's part of the overall conversation. But in terms of the taxation system, that we're reflecting the environmental and social cost of goods and services, as well as the cost of production. And this is in line with recommendations from the European Commission. So it's the carbon tax, I suppose, is probably the most high profile environmental tax in the last few years years um, the climate change advisory council recommends that it rise to 80 per ton 80 euro per ton of co2 emitted by 2030 so i suppose a lot of the conversations recently have been about reducing the cost of living but the carbon tax is a relatively small proportion of the cost of fuel and um, things like excise duties would account for a much larger proportion of the overall cost now i just listened to we have a podcast from a colleague she spoke to Community Law and Mediation Centre. They have a Centre for Environmental Justice and one of the speakers there had the stats for that if anybody wants to go back and have a listen. So this particular chart then lists the ways in which the tax is being allocated and the highest proportion of that then is spent on fuel allowance and energy poverty upgrades. A carbon tax does have to be well designed and I suppose the key thing maybe is, is choice. Sometimes it's very difficult if you're going to put a tax on something and people have no choice but to use that good. So overall then, our review of tax expenditures is long overdue, and we would look then that carbon tax be ring fenced for the just transition. Environment and sustainability then, um, according to figures from the EPA in 2019, Ireland created 3.1 million tonnes of municipal waste and recycled only 37% of it. In 2019 we generated over 1.1 million, ton, million tons of packaging which was an increase on 2018. I can only imagine how much packaging we created in 2020 when we were all sitting at home getting stuff delivered to the door. Um, much of this packaging consists of plastic, paper and cardboard with a smaller volumes of glass, wood and metal. Almost all of this is sent abroad for recycling. And the EPA notes that the data indicates that the increase in plastic packaging recycled is offset by an even greater increase in the amount of packaging waste being generated and incinerated. And as a result then, the recycling rates have shown a, a general 
downward trend. We do have the waste action plan for a circular economy. It's um, the new waste policy spanning 2020 to 2025. And that states then that we need to embed climate action in all strands of public policy. And the plan is to shift focus away from waste disposal and look instead how we can preserve resources by creating a circular economy. I think there might be a socioeconomic dimension to that as well, which we can maybe discuss. Uh, I'd be interested to maybe hear what people have to say about that. Um, the Waste Action Plan notes that if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest global greenhouse gas emitter behind only China and the United States. So you can see from this one then that much of our household waste is still being collected as general waste. And we need to be really, really, I suppose, trying our best then to get green bins and brown bins or whatever, whatever colour they are as you go around the country that is suitable for composting. And what they've noted as well is that to, um, to improve our recycling rates, um, legislation does actually make a difference. The two there in the grids are when legislation was brought in and you can see there's been an increase then in the amount of bio waste that was accepted every time legislation changes. So the policy priorities here, we need to examine cost barriers to refuse management and recycling and ensure that every locality has ease of access. Last one, global challenges. Um, climate change, which is causing extreme weather events around the world, coupled with the pandemic, has left disadvantaged countries struggling. Added to this is a looming debt crisis for low and middle income countries where a growing debt burden threatens to drown out social spending. Much of the current discourse here is about building back better, just transition and well-being, which does demonstrate an awareness that we can and must change how we do things for the better. The chance to build back better, though, must be offered to all. And yet research shows here that many countries are spending more on debt repayments than education, health and social protection combined. I hate actually, I, I like to go out on a high and this is probably the most depressing slide of them all. Um, with the South Sudan there, you can see spending a over 11 times more on debt service than on those vital social services of, of the proportion of their GDP. I mean, there's riots in Sri Lanka at the moment, again, linked to, to, to exactly this. Um, and you'll see it there, I think, if you come in from the, the right-hand side there, Sri Lanka's fifth or sixth from the end. Currently, there are more than 60 countries spending more on debt financing than they do on healthcare. So we've always called for, I suppose, a permanent cancellation of all external debt payments due from developing countries with no penalties. And then we are regularly commended by the OECD Development Assistance Committee Peer Review for the effectiveness of our aid programme. And we can be justifiably proud of our record in providing high quality, untied grant paced aid. However, we still lack a strategy for reaching the UN target of 0.7% of national income. And again, we call on government to develop a roadmap with a view to reaching this target. And as you can see from the chart, we reached um, 0.52 at the peak. That's the highest we've ever managed. So again, the policy priorities here, again, to support the international campaigns for the liberation of overseas debt and to renew our commitment to meet the UN target. I am done. Um, I'll stop share and, and I'll talk for you. I can have a cup of tea now and I stop talking very fast. Well, look, thank you, Suzanne. That was um that was amazing. Um it was a real, a real roller coaster uh through so many different different issues. But uh, yeah. I I'll tell you what's what struck me. Um was that, I mean, you were looking at, at these topics through the lens of, of climate, um, but that one, it, it reinforced so many existing pro-social justice policies. Um, and then the other one that, that stood out to me was that, um, I mean, the, 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 there has been for a, a long time seemingly a, a tension between, um, we'll say, environmental policies and social justice policies. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the things which you called out yeah. I would identify as as being very old green issues like a side value tax, basic income, deliberate democracy. I mean, e even when when you you know got onto the last slide and and, and you know global debt issues and things like that, they're they're actually quite core green you know issues for for a long time. So that that's one thing that stood out to me. Um, so it, just while while there's other people possibly putting their hands up to to ask a question, um, one. Could I ask you to, to comment on that if you could? And, and then I, I have another one which I'll 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 drop on you. Uh, maybe it's it's maybe 
the hottest topic right now. <laughs> <laughs> you can guess what it is. Uh, so carbon taxes, um, carbon taxes. how, yeah. you know, the, the, the idea of ring fencing them for social welfare increases, uh, as is done now with fuel allowance, retrofitting schemes and so on. Um, and then also you mentioned it about, um, you know, how the design of these taxes and then, you know, individual households, you know, abilities to, you know, make their, their decisions around them and how, how it can disproportionately affect some people um, more than others. Um, and then I suppose related to that is the whole issue of, of income inequality and how environmental taxes go across that. So, okay, that was an awful lot to dump on you. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start at the very beginning. Um, no, I, I think you're right. I think an awful lot of us think in silos. And the I think the beauty of Social Justice Ireland and the challenge of Social Justice Ireland is that it's cross-group, cross-issue. So, because everything is connected. They're all the same. You cannot work on, like I, I often think that, say, uh, I'd say, say this particular moment in time, we have, a, a, let's say, an arm of government or a government department, and they are looking for foreign direct investment, bringing in jobs, bringing in construction. Let's build some data centers. You know what I mean? Brilliant, 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 brilliant. You know, European uh, headquarters, uh, world beaters, American groups. And then you've got somebody else then saying, mm, yeah, they're using a lot of electricity. We're going to have brownouts. And then you have somebody else then saying, well, actually, we need to prepare everybody for a digital transition. We want to get laptops in front of everybody. We want all our older people online. We want to move all our services online. We've sent every kid home with a tablet. So three, three departments doing their very, very, very best. Everybody's working really hard. Everybody's doing a great job, but that they're in tension with each other. So it's that we need to move away, I think, from that siloed thinking. And again, even sort of universal basic income, that that's a very lefty idea. And yet, if you sell it right, the, 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 the right in America is very pro-universal basic income because it removes the government and it removes. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? You can, you can see how you can actually, if, if you sell it right, um, you, can, you, can, you can make different people come at the same thing from a different angle. So I think that's the first thing that there is an enormous amount of crossover and we don't really grasp it, I don't think, um, enough. Uh, carbon taxes, I know I was thinking, well, I take this slide out because I'll be at. Um, it's a really difficult one, I think, because ultimately you, you, you tax things to change people's behavior. So you tax cigarettes out the, up the hill, do you know what I mean? You tax... Um, so you you know you're, you're you're looking for those kind of things you're looking to make behavioral changes and ultimately we do need to make behavioral changes in how we use energy we have to the difficulty is uh what was that ad what was your man was looking for directions and he said well i wouldn't start from here anyway ideally we should have been retrofitting social houses 20 years ago we should have been building more social homes 20 years ago they should be a rated low income householders should be paying tuppence halfpenny for their heating and lighting do you know what i mean like that's that's what we should be that's the ideal situation that's what i would like to see um you know but carbon taxes i suppose if even like even things like fuel allowance ultimately you're just subsidizing extra use so the, the whole thing i think is the whole thing i think needs to be utterly dismantled and and started from from somewhere else, you know, community electricity generation, community ownership of turbines, community ownership of solar panels. Um, Bohemians Football Club in Dublin, I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, they have a climate justice officer and they are talking about putting solar panels up in the, what you call the stadium um, and using that energy for, and, and giving it back or, or selling it or doing something with the local community. The community around them is very mixed. Bits of it are, um, you know, some of it's very she she and some of it's then, you know, you've got, uh, you know, like a four story home with maybe 40 people living in it. So I, I actually think that for me, I think I, I would, you, you would be moving away from all of those, ultimately moving away from all of those things into a completely different model of energy generation and energy consumption, um, which is my way of getting out of the question, I think. 
Well done. Uh, you're, you're a better politician than I am, I think. Um, NASA, your hand is, is raised. Hiya. Uh, sorry, I look a bit of a fright today. <laughs> um, thanks a million for, for doing this, Suzanne. It's, it's really brilliant. And it's like such an excellent overview that you've given us of like so many kind of like it's, it's such a broad set of issues. Um, so I, I guess, um, and just say, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that, you know, your, your, your skills are untransferable. I'm sitting here beside records. So I, some of us are still buying them, but uh, <laughs> I have, um, I'm very valid. I, I, I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> are you, I, I'm all blurred out, but that's all records right there. Um, so I, I guess, uh, and actually it was really interesting you bringing up um, timber building because like, I think one of the things that's really um, hit me in the last few weeks, because obviously that's my my previous life. And one of the things we don't talk about is like the the the, the lifespan of of concrete. And like I'm sitting in a house now in Cabra and it's all shuttered concrete and it's a very small house and we're really not we're gone too big for it. And we can't really move. Um, and actually, if you look at like timber frame buildings, we don't talk enough about the demountability of them and like the adaptation of them because like they're so cheaper so much cheaper to change as well as the carbon impact so i um i guess i have three questions i wanted to ask one is around that issue of just transition and i don't unfortunately get the impression that there's huge amount of urgency in mm. in the kind of delivery of like a really well thought out just transition which is frustrating because other european countries are doing much better um, than us in terms of kind of codifying it into legislation. Um, and I guess one of my questions, my, my kind of core question there is like, how do you think or how much do you think we should centre kind of union voices into the just transition piece? Um, and, you know, how important is it that we're it, it, it's kind of centred in like very stringent, like working condition requirements and like working and like job targets and things like that. So. Um, because I, I, I think as much as anyone, I'm, I'm guilty of misusing the phrase just transition and it's an actual thing. Um, the, the second thing was I was really interested in your kind of identification of care and caring work. And I struggle with that sometimes of like monetizing, mm. like the only way to recognize caring work is to monetize it. And as a kind of a previous care, sometimes I can see the downside to that because it becomes a very like like there's downsides to monetizing everything in society yeah so i'd be interested in your thoughts on that and then finally um and just to say on budget oversight we're doing a whole piece on tax expenditures in the next few months and hopefully that'll put pressure on the mm. department of finance that's the point of doing it i guess is to put pressure yeah. on the department of finance to have a proper look at tax expenditures because we got the parliamentary budget office to do a review of it and it was shocking it's like seven billion a year and 23 percent of the tax expenditures have never been looked at yeah nobody's no. never looked at them yeah yeah. crazy stuff but anyway that's not the question my question was how did just social justice ireland feel about indexing indexing of both social welfare payments and taxes at the same time and would you would you index them to prices or to wages and how, how what's the thoughts there uh, I'll, I'll go back to the very beginning record store day is tomorrow uh I know I have I have I have a couple of pieces put aside for us they, they've already said that they'll put a couple of bits aside for us but that I actually have that written down. So this is the end of Fashion Revolution Week and tomorrow is Record Store Day. And those are things that they're the sort of, con this is what I really want. We should be having conversations around just transition Record Store Day, just transition, you know what I mean? Like vinyl is so unenvironmentally friendly, it's not even funny. Um, it doesn't decay. Now I'm sure most people want to be buried with their collection, so I'm sure that's going to be all right. But it's conversations around like work, going back to work, going back to unions. For an artist or a musician today, they cannot make a living on selling product anymore. It can't be done. Um, and again, the digital thing, uh, you know, that sort of way, because I, I, I like that. I presume I think product is product and then digital doesn't exist. But obviously it does. It's on a data center. Touring is the only way that they can make money. The carbon footprint of that is shocking. So a just transition for musicians, a just transition for um, the clothes we wear. And I suppose to echo what Oliver had said, we, we don't really, we don't pay the full price for what we consume. Um, so I think that first thing about just transition, that's the difficulty. We think of just transition, we think of the farmers, we think of rinsing out your plastics and making sure they're out in the green bin. And we think about putting your bottles out and we think about maybe maybe an electric car i mean i was brought up in them 
concrete houses in Cabra that are only freezing they are. Do you know what I mean? Childhood spent picking the neck curtains off the window when they froze into the window, um, you know, pre-central heating. Like we it it it's going to impact. And I think that's the bit I think we're not really, I don't actually think we can get our heads around it. Um that we need to consume less and we need to pay more for what we consume. Is it right that I can go in 365 days a year or 364 days a year and buy six kiwis in a plastic tray wrapped in plastic for one euro? And then they'll be buy one, get one free. So I throw the other six in the bin in a week because I didn't meet them quickly enough. So it's I think that's that's the difficult part, I think, of the just transition conversation. It's the clothes I'm wearing. Conversations around clothes are things like, you know, buy vintage. Um, you know, get a classic style that'll last forever. And you're kind of going, I'm 16. I don't want to look like Jackie on that. What are you talking about? You know what I mean? I'm in pennies. I'm buying whatever's, whatever, whatever I'm wearing this week because I won't be wearing it in three weeks time because it'll just be, you know, it's old hat. So I think that's the difficult part is every single thing we do. Do you buy a book? Do you put it on Kindle? Do you buy a record? Well, of course you buy a record. Obviously, yeah. I'll, 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 be, I'll be in town. I'm already, I'm already arranged to pick up my mate for seven o'clock in the morning. It's like we'll be in the queue for eight. Um, but it's every single aspect of your life will require a transition. And I suppose it's about making sure that because I do think there's a socioeconomic aspect to that as well. I think if you're low income household, if you're living in a family hub, if you're living in emergency accommodation, say you're on your own with two small kids, are you going to be using Terry nappies because it's more environmentally friendly? No. Are you washing out your plastics and recycling them? No. Um, you're probably, if, if you're cooking at all, it's on a microwave. Um, it's all of that. Can you even afford to put out a bin bag? What's a bin bag cost now? So the privatization of our waste, you know, all of that kind of, I mean, I could go on for days. Um, and that's, that's really why, why we look at every aspect, education, transport, is because everything is connected. There's no point in fixing one and then forgetting about the other. Um, so I, I think that's the challenge. I just don't, I don't actually think we've grasped what it is that we need to do. And, and ultimately, I don't know if we want to do it. I mean, Electricity is a recent enough invention. The way we live today is a recent invention. Being able to go to Berlin for 20 euro and back, being able to go to Bilbao for 20 euro and back, is that right? You know, we've gotten used to it now, you know, that kind of a way. Mm. I remember going to America in the, in the 80s and the, my plane ticket cost me a month's wage, whereas now a plane ticket might cost you half a week's wage. Mm. We used to go to Berlin to record shop. We just yeah. haven't done that in a decade, but yeah. Yeah, you know, so it's all of that. So I, I, we, we, it's about, it's about every single aspect of your life. And I just think that's when your brain just caves in and you just think, nah, I can't be doing this. You know what I mean? Like, it's, I think it's actually too much, I think, for us to, to comprehend. Um, so that's my answer to your first question. <laughs> and, and the second one, I suppose, yeah, like, the transactional nature of caring work, I suppose what we're looking for, I suppose, is an acknowledgement that um, that it exists and that if somebody doesn't do it in their own home, there is a cost to the exchequer. Um, everybody either personally or by one remove knows of somebody who's caring for either littlers or older family members and there would be a there would be a cost if the family didn't step in and do that. And again, I suppose in the last hundred years with women in the workplace, that ruined everything really, Nessa. I mean, full stop. Um, but you know what I mean? Like no uh, more unpaid labor. No more I, guess, unpaid. I guess it's similar to the conversation from the last question, though, is that like it, it's not a nice thing. It's not a nice conversation to have to say to someone like you are doing work that has real value and yet you're not getting paid for it like it's not it's a difficult yeah. kind of yeah I, I don't always know how to yeah but then on the, on the other side I am uncomfortable with the idea that you put a, like a price tag on every single thing yeah because families yeah. do these things for all sorts of reasons so and I don't know what the answer is yeah yeah and, and I mean I, I read recently even I think it was something to do about it was something to do with I think probably public participation and 
gathering data and being culturally aware of the communities that you were in. Uh, I think it was based in the UK, but they had said that they had gone out and I think had a discussion about caring for older members of your family. And in certain cultures, could, there, was, there was no mention of anybody outside the family taking care of older members. It just didn't happen. So it is, I suppose, it's, it's, the, way, it's the way our society is currently structured that I work full time, therefore um, I am unable to provide that caring duty elsewhere. And I know what you mean. I don't get paid to look after my kid. That's kind of presumed. But at the same time, there, there is a cost then if I pay somebody else to do it. So, you know, it is it's a difficult one, I think. Yeah, and, and affects it, women so much more differently. Very much so. And I suppose it goes back maybe to even that, that sort of the, the, the artist's basic income. I have to quote in my head, and it was something to do with Newgrange or something along those lines. That obviously, think of the, think of the, the calories that were consumed building Newgrange when obviously your full day was spent collecting calories and eating. So the quote that sticks in my mind is the artist was freed up by their community to do this work. You know, and I just, that, that always stuck with me. I thought, well, that's almost, that's what the, the basic income for artists is, is that if we value this in our culture, um, that we, we free up the artists to do this work. So they give back to us as a community. So I suppose it's about it's about kind of valuing different different types of work, and then the third question was about indexation. Oh, indexation. Yeah, I mean, ours is it, that it should be indexed to. I know what you mean. Yeah, if you, if you if you stick it to the basket of goods like the Messel, obviously the Messel is higher. Um, so the Messel is the minimum essential standard of living basket of goods that's priced from the Vincentian Partnership for Social Justice. And what they do is it's a consensus basket of goods um, and they go out and they price it thousands of items. And what they'll arrive at is a figure, I think it's about 240 odd euro a week, that you, the goods that you need to consume to lead a basic but decent standard of living will cost you 240 euro a week. The dole is 208, so there's a gap there straight away. And the metal doesn't include accommodation. So 208, you are expected to cover your accommodation costs out of that 208 euro a week. Um, so there's a huge gap. Generally speaking, I suppose, as inflation moves, wages will move. Um, and then, but so, I mean, our, our policy priority is to index it at 27.5% of average earnings and that's linked back to a commitment that was made in 2007 for it to be linked to 30 percent of gross average industrial earnings which data set is no longer being kept um, so it has to be i think once it has to be grounded in something at the moment 208 is nothing it's just a number yeah 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 it's complete um political yeah. whim yeah. but yeah. It, 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 do you think it should be social welfare and tax it should be both that are indexed um I, I i don't know enough about the tax side of things to be honest with you so i'm not even going to well, we, we we are just to say we had a very interesting representation from kind of the head of like the the english version or the uk version of uh the pbo or the sri or one of these kind of you know it was a government version oh. and in the uk they've had it since the 70s there was these two labor mps who got it like attached to some completely random budget bill and uh, since then, they've managed to have it like they've had it, they've had indexation, but it's been set aside more often than it's actually been used. And he spent like 45 minutes, 50 minutes explaining all the different ways it's been set aside and not um, implemented and how annoying that was and how frustrating it was, because at least like for them, it's like a very clear benchmark. And so yeah. at the end, I was expecting him to say, well, it wasn't really that impactful. But when we asked him how impactful it was, he was like raving about how even when it's because almost all indexation in all the different countries can be set aside for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, but he was raving about it in, in terms of like how important a, a, an implementation factor it was because everybody knew what the rules were, basically. Yeah. And so even when you were setting it aside, everybody knew that you were setting it aside and that this is the rate it should have been but you decided to set it aside. So even just to kind of, so that everybody knew what the benchmarks were yeah. and everybody knew what the rules were, it was really, really, he said it had been a huge, like game changer in UK policy. And I just thought that was really interesting. 
that's weird because I've never I've never heard of that over there. I mean, I would do a lot of I I, I would I suppose to quote Tony Fahey, um, we wait for the UK to do it, watch it fail, and then we try it. So I like to keep on top of. Well, you know, he, he he talked about it in terms of, for example, fuel excise and things like that right. as, a, as an example where it's been set yeah. aside but also where it has been really powerful or where it could be really powerful is um loans for students which obviously we don't have here um yeah. but I, I i think he gave us some details i, I could send it on but anyway yeah. I, I, having him say that like it had not really been used and then say it actually be really powerful i thought was very right. interesting yeah yeah i think they have to be i suppose yeah, you're trying you're trying to ground it in some sort of lived reality really aren't you what what we what we earn and what we pay back well i suppose it's the tax expenditures piece really is is vital as well i mean that's because that's tax foregone yeah that the, the numbers there are crazy when you think that there's so little oversight pretty much yeah. nobody's watching yeah scary okay we're, we're, we're at eight suzanne uh, yeah. but if i could yeah. hold you for for maybe five more minutes just on if I can pick up two things that you mentioned there and, and, and throw them at you because uh, I, I one I think it was amazing I'd never heard the the, the phrase uh, just transition from from musicians before but it makes absolute sense um, I mean we've been hearing musicians talk about about this for about you know 10 years at least um, and basically what they've been describing is the impact of, of an unjust transition um, and I was pleasantly surprised in your presentation that you mentioned farming as being you know the the a central just mm. transition um, you know sector uh, in Ireland because I I don't think that's often or at least it does, I don't think it's called out often enough um and I I, I, I wonder to, to what degree uh farmers and farming organizations um, and farming communities kind of you know have have in their minds crystallized the concept of a just transition and what it means so that that's one thing if I can throw at you just generally, uh, how, how these things are crystallized in, pe in people's minds. Um, and then the other one, I, if I can, because um, I, I think it's also a, 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 um, a kind of a topic that comes up a lot uh, when we're talking about um, environmental taxes mainly, um, but you know, more broadly, the cost of, of, of environmental uh, action. Um, and how you, you mentioned that we need to consume less uh, and we need to pay more for what we consume. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, different demographics in society consume unequally. Yeah. Um, and there are, you know, there are, you know, there is there are some uh, who consume a lot. There's some who, who consume so little that, that they're they're you know, at the point of precariousness. Um, and I, I just wonder what, what your thoughts are on those two things. Um, and then we'll let you go after that because it is a gap. <laughs> Oh, I'd love to say I had somewhere to be on a Friday night, <laughs> but you're grand. Um, I suppose, yeah, I see for me, I suppose I, I'm trying to broaden out that just transition conversation and look at uh, people I know, people, um, I suppose just different industries and different ways of approaching it. And it was actually, uh, I think it was, it was a Sleaford Mods documentary or the, the movie about Sleaford Mods I'd watch. And again, he says that at the end of it, you know what I mean? That like all this touring and he said, it's just the carbon footprint is outrageous. And I thought, oh yeah, she's right. And there's an organization, I think they're in, they're a European organization, Impala, I-M-P-A-L-A. -A, and again, they're looking at, I suppose, that sort of carbon footprint for the music industry and a just transition for the music industry. I couldn't find anybody, um, there's an, I think there's an English, is it Music Emergency UK? And I couldn't see anybody here. But I think that's, that's I think it's exactly with the farmers. I think you need to be, we do need to be, all of us on an individual household level are, will have to make a transition um, to a different way of life. And I suppose it is just, supposed to go on to the second question then, it's about making sure who, it was that, 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 that there's a fairness in that because again it's well documented that like that one percent um their carbon footprint's outrageous you know and they always kind of you know when they talk about davos and then they kind of go well everybody jetted in on their private jets and everybody had you know a limo with one guy in the back and a you know a driver um that the carbon footprint i think of that one percent is is huge it's absolutely huge but i suppose don't get me wrong look I don't want to I don't want to consume less I like things I like stuff 
I like avocados, I like kiwis, I like pineapples, um, you know, I like uh, you know, garlic puree or whatever you're having, you know what I mean? I like fancy things and I don't really want to pay anything for them. I want stuff as cheaply as possible. That's that's who we are as people. But I don't know how long that's viable in in general you know i don't know how long we can carry on with this with more than one pair of shoes more like again if you think back to 200 years ago 100 years ago very little electricity we weren't we didn't have this kind of connectivity if you think back to it everything before that then we didn't have this much stuff nobody had this much stuff and do we need this much stuff? I mean, I like my stuff, don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-stuff, I love stuff. But I don't know how viable in a just transition conversation all of this stuff is. And I'm so conscious of the socioeconomic aspect of that. I'm so conscious of, of a low-income household. A low-income household should be allowed as much stuff as a middle-income household, as a high-income household. Um, so you are asking, what you really are trying to do is ask everybody maybe to make changes to how they conduct themselves, how they, you know, what they consume. But I just, I just don't know how viable the way we currently live is. And that like, that makes me sad, you know, I, it, it does, you know, um, because it was nice and I like it. Yeah, it, thanks very much. I, I, I just, in, in your last remark, I, I, you know, there, there is you know, the, the concept of, um, you know, grief, um, to do with, with climate change. Um, and I, a conversation I had a, co a couple of weeks back with, with somebody was about, um, you know, that, that, that concept of grief is associated mostly with the younger generation um, and, and the fears that they have. But I think also there's a, an element to which an older generation who are used to having, as you say, stuff, um, and are used to having ambitions around those, that stuff, um, having to let go of it. And that, that's, that's a part of, of kind of grief. Uh, look, Thank you, uh, Suzanne. It's it's been didn't mean to end on a bummer. <laughs> no, you didn't. Uh, it's it it was it was a roller coaster of, of a talk on Earth Day. So thank you very much. Um, and it 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 reminds us again, and it, it, even more so during the discussion, how much of an overlap there is between, uh, you know, environmental action and and social justice action. It's not even an overlap, as you said. Same it, thing. It, we've got used to thinking of things in silos, and they're not silos. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. It's one action. Yeah. Uh, so look. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne Rogers from uh, Social Justice Ireland, Research and Policy Analyst. Uh, I am going to put a link uh, when we share this video uh, to your uh, National Social Monitor on a Just Transition. Super. So thank you very much. Best of luck. Have a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy Record Store Day tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and happy birthday, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.